Thanks for the uh, intro- introduction. Yeah. Let's do that tonight. <coughs> tonight. I can't predict that. Um, thank you very much. So a couple of weeks ago, I was trying to brainstorm some ideas uh, for for this grand rounds talk, and I briefly flirted, flirted with the idea of extending my um, trauma series talk to uh, possibly adrenal trauma, but I thought that was probably stretching it a bit too thin, and so. I got a little bit nostalgic because uh, this is my last grand rounds as as a resident and looking back at the last four and a half years of residency there's obviously a lot of uh, emphasis on surgery like most surgical programs but when you ask any medical student or if you ask the first year residents you know why do they go into urology they'll invariably say well I like it because there's a good mix of surgery and medicine so with that being said I wanted to talk about drugs in urology it's a, a potpourri of uh, subjects, and there's a lot of uh, material to go through, but I wanted to cover a couple of topics and hopefully generate some discussion and uh, possibly have some staff uh, um, give their opinions uh, about uh, what they see in clinic and, and how, how these drugs respond. But uh, first I first want to talk about uh, antibiotics and specifically uh, GU prophylaxis guidelines, and then uh, move on to stones and talk about medical expulsion uh, therapies as well as medical management of stones and then uh, briefly uh, compare some of the PD-5 inhibitors as well as talk a bit about cardiac safety in these drugs and then uh, talk about the uh, options for uh, premature ejaculation and finally end off with uh, a bit about uh, testosterone supplementation. Uh, I was originally going to talk about uh, two additional uh, areas however uh, just for the interest of uh, time as well, Jenny also covered uh, the chronic prostatitis uh, in a previous grand round, so I'll just talk about these four subjects. So moving on to antibiotics. Uh, there was a national surgical infection prevention project that was uh, uh, developed and is basically uh, taking a look at various antibiotic uh, prophylaxis regimes for different uh, surgeries, colorectal, gynecology, and, and urology. Uh, and really the goal of antibiotic prophylaxis is to prevent local and systemic infections uh, following a procedure. They state that the ideal time is to give the antibiotics 30 to 60 minutes before the procedure and uh, two hours for vancomycin and uh, fluoroquinolones to try to prevent any um, infusion related uh, uh, complications or reactions. And uh, it's thought that uh, giving the antibiotics at the time of anesthesia induction is okay since you achieve adequate uh, tissue levels uh, when you make the surgical incision. The goal is to maintain efficacious levels during the procedure. And uh, really, there's, there's no proven benefit of extending antibiotic prophylaxis beyond 24 hours following the procedure. For, you want to take a look at uh, the patient and see if they have any risk factors uh, that may increase the risk of infection. Uh, such as advanced age, uh, poor nutrition status, if they have immunodeficiency, uh, any of these reasons uh, may warrant uh, antibiotic prophylaxis. So just going through uh, each of the uh, GU procedures, for a simple catheter insertion and removal, in the ideal host, there's no absolute uh, indication for antibiotic prophylaxis. As well, uh, patients that have chronic indoor catheters or patients who have the indoor catheters and at the time of their uh, catheter changes, do not necessarily need prophylactic antibiotics. Uh, similarly, urodynamics, there's no absolute indication in the ideal host uh, for antibiotic prophylaxis. However, uh, additional risk factors include uh, bladder elevated obstruction, neurogenic bladder, and spinal cord injured patients that may require antibiotic prophylaxis here. For trust prostate biopsies, fluoroquinolones are recommended. However, the optimal duration of the uh, antibiotic prophylaxis is uh, up to debate. Um, there's a recent study that's showing that uh, one versus three days of antibiotics uh, may be uh, equal. However, uh, it wasn't quite conclusive. For shockwave lithotripsy, um, antibiotics uh, prophylaxis is recommended because it decreases the rate of uh, UTIs. Uh, and a meta-analysis of randomized clinical trials is shown to be uh, cost-effective when you take into account uh, the, the cost associated with hospital admission for urosepsis and pyelonephritis. For lower GU tract procedures, uh, for cystoscopy, again, uh, there's no absolute indications for antibiotic prophylaxis in the ideal host. However, for more invasive procedures such as a, a TERP or a turbot, 
uh, it is recommended. And a uh, meta-analysis of uh, TURPS uh, is shown to decrease the rate of septicemia as well as bacteriuria. Uh, and just of note, uh, they recommend uh, antibiotic prophylaxis for the duration while the for the duration of the catheter, uh, because it is shown that a short course of antibiotics versus a single dose is more effective in decreasing bacteriuria. For upper GU tract procedures, such as ureteroscopy or PNLs, it's uh, recommended. Uh, and uh, in patients that are at increased risk of a post op infection are those that have a longer pr procedure. And as a corollary from that, uh, um, those with uh, gr a greater amount of uh, irrigant used. For a uh, majority of open and laparoscopic cases, uh, prophylaxis is recommended. Uh, of note, uh, using bowel uh, to in reconstruction, um, it's recommended that uh, second generation cephalosporin or the use of uh, ANSEF and uh, Flagyl is recommended in, in these procedures. Uh, just to reemphasize that uh, they did not think there was any benefit of extending the uh, uh, duration of antibiotic prophylaxis for more than 24 hours in these patients. Moving on to uh, endocarditis prophylaxis, uh, the American Heart Associ Association put forth these guidelines in 1997 and they recommended uh, prophylaxis in their high risk or moderate risk categories. And specifically taking a look at uh, urological procedures, which is, it, it's important because the urinary tract is the second most common uh, portal of entry for organisms that cause endocarditis. So essentially, it's recommended in virtually all uh, urological procedures, including uh, prostatic surgeries, cystoscopies, and even urethral dilatation. However, it's not recommended when there's a simple, uninfected urethral catheterization or a circumcision or uh, incision or biopsy of a surgically scrubbed skin. The regime that's used in high-risk patients is uh, ampicillin and gentamicin. And just a note for the residents to remember to give uh, ampicillin six hours after the initial dose as well. And for moderate risk patients, uh, it's uh, just uh, ampicillin or amoxicillin. And uh, enterococcus is the most common organism causing endocarditis after a urologic procedure. The uh, AUA in comp... Sorry. Yep. Why does the current use of antibiotics prior to I believe it's the uh, a script for Cipro for two days, the day before and the day of. So, uh, Cipro doesn't cover other topics, right? What do you think about that? I think if, if you're concerned about endocarditis, um, prophylaxis in those patients, you'd give an additional, you could give additional amp amoxicillin coverage with that. Yep. Just on that. I have another question though. You talked about open uh, prophylaxis global surgery where you entering the colon. What about around the prospect to give these patients prophylaxis antibiotics? Did you find anything in the literature? Well, yeah. certainly it's helpful when you do open the bowel. And that's a rare event. Mm -hmm. If you give a you know, uh, thousand patients antibiotics for the two or three the, the guideline for uh, radical prostatectomy is it's considered a clean contaminated procedure because you're entering the, the urinary tract. So uh, along those guidelines, it would be, it'd be just the uh, ANSEF generally, first generation cephalosporin. The uh, AUA in uh, combination with the um, uh, Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons uh, put forth these guidelines for antibiotic prophylaxis in patients with total joint replacements in uh, 2003, and they recommended uh, prophylaxis uh, for all patients within two years uh, following a prostatic joint replacement, as well as uh, immunocompromised patients and patients with those listed comorbidities. So uh, they recommend Cipro or AMP and Gent. So I just want to briefly run over uh, uh, the antibiotics that are safe and contraindicated in pregnancy. It's more so for, for uh, R5s uh, sitting for the exams, but uh, these are generally the antibiotics considered safe during pregnancy, um, and some that are relatively contraindicated at certain times during pregnancy, and uh, those that are absolutely contraindicated uh, during pregnancy. 
And uh, again, another list uh, to go through. Um, we, do, we deal a lot with patients that uh, may have uh, renal failure. And so certain drugs require no dose adjustment, uh, mostly because they're hepatically uh, metabolized, whereas uh, the majority of uh, antibiotics do require adjustment. So moving on to stones, I'm going to talk about medical expulsion therapy. And the concept here is uh, the use of medications to help relax renal smooth muscle. Uh, this may help uh, facilitate passage of uh, stones in the ureter, especially in the distal ureter. The two most studied drugs have been calcium channel blockers, which is a smooth muscle relaxant, and alpha blockers, since there are some A1 um, adrenergic receptors within the ureter. Taking a look at um, some randomized clinical trials uh, on the subject, uh, the majority uh, only include studies with, uh, only include patients that have uh, distal ureteric stones. And a lot of these studies uh, come from Turkey, uh, Middle East, as well as uh, Italy. And uh, they often use concomitant steroids to help decrease uh, ureal edema. Taking a look at uh, studies with calcium channel blockers, uh, some, most studies show uh, a benefit in terms of increased rate of stone passage and decreased uh, mean days uh, to stone passage, or some do not. However, tamsulosin is uh, more studied than uh, the calcium channel blockers. And when you take a look at a study comparing uh, the, the alpha blockers, it appears as though tamsulosin uh, is probably equivalent to different types of alpha blockers in terms of their effect on stone passage. I just wanted to examine uh, this one particular randomized clinical trial by Della Bella in Italy. It's the largest uh, series to date, and it's uh, adequately powered to determine uh, if there's any uh, significant difference between, um, between these groups. So they took 210 patients, randomized them to three groups. The uh, control group was the first group, and they uh, gave them a weak N equilinergic. The uh, second group received tamsulosin, and the third group received a uh, calcium channel blocker. All of the groups above uh, did receive uh, concomitant steroids as well. Uh, taking a look at the baseline characteristics, they're all quite similar with the exception of the tamsulosin group that had a uh, larger mean stone size. Despite this, it's found that uh, tamsulosin had a significantly uh, uh, better uh, stone-free uh, rate or a percentage of expulsion compared to the con both the control group and the calcium channel blocker group. As well, the uh, time to expulsion was uh, significantly less uh, in compared to both groups. When, when uh, the calcium channel blocker group was compared to the control group of the anticholinergics, there was no difference between the two. So this study suggests that uh, tamsulosin may be uh, better than uh, calcium channel blockers in terms of uh, medical expulsion uh, therapy. A uh, recent uh, meta-analysis in Lancet uh, took a look at uh, all the randomized clinical trials and they found that uh, there was nine uh, studies that actually had a, a real control group, i.e. Uh, a placebo group uh, that they were con uh, comparing the uh, medical treatment with. There's a lot of studies that um, included the use of uh, steroids or uh, weak anticholinergics uh, or, or use those as a control groups. However, when you compare the, the two different, uh, when you compare the two different uh, groups of, uh, of uh, studies, there's really no significant uh, effect of adding these additional treatments, i.e. there's no significant effect of adding the, the steroids or the weak anticholinergics. They also uh, found that there's three um, studies taking a look at uh, comparing uh, tamsulosin versus calcium channel blockers. They found that uh, the Della Bella study was the only one that uh, showed a difference between the two. Uh, the, other, the other two um, studies uh, had no difference between uh, Flomax or, or Tamsulosin, or sorry, and uh, calcium channel blocker. So in, in summary, for medical expulsion treatment, um, it appears as though uh, Tamsulosin has, has better effect than uh, calcium channel blocker. And uh, you know, given the familiarity of uh, the drug with urologists, it's uh, probably more in, in favor because of that anyways. Uh, so it seems to be a reasonable option, uh, especially when you're awaiting uh, surgical management of uh, distal ureteric stone. Anyways, any comments or any, ex any experience? Sorry? Oh, <laughs> resins. <laughs>
a lot of these studies uh, weren't for a significant period of time. They didn't uh, evaluate the patients at, say, a month or two months. Uh, a lot of them were within two weeks. Uh, some were even just eight days. So, um, you know, we know that 95% of stones usually pass within the first 35 to 40 days. So maybe the, the duration of the, uh, the time was the factor there. Uh, Mark, they use bolides. What rate do you uh, put the patient for us to wear cataracts? Sorry? Sorry. The uh, side effect of bolides is quite cataracts, so this is very possible. What, what do you tell the patient? Tell the patient that it's possible for a new drug or use? For the side effects of yeah, bolides? Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it's possible to have side effects, but oftentimes you put these patients on short duration of this. You know, if you're going to wait um, three to four weeks or five weeks before you you act on on, on the stones, um, usually it's uh, you, you leave these patients on these medications for less time than that. Yeah, it's it's interesting to note. Um, they noted no no real predictive value of size uh, for the spontaneous passage of stones, i.e., even large stones. You know, stones up to six, seven millimeters were, were passing uh, on, on either spontaneously or with the aid of these drugs. Um, so it's an interesting um, interesting uh, side that uh, no one can actually really. Explain because it's usually thought that stone size is a major predictor in, in whether or not a stone will pass. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's what was surprising about these studies. Uh, um, was that yes, there was. Realizing that's mean size. That's mean size. Um, and so I think that's rather impressive in our experience. In my experience, in our experience, we get routinely and uh, give them a go. If it's in the district, you're seven millimeter stone. If it's eight, nine centimeters, both of them. So otherwise, you can want to go ahead and otherwise, they can come back again. Yeah. Or if you fall up two weeks later, they're still out of stone. And we talked about the uh, options and management. Uh, yeah. These studies suggest that. I'm sorry, but it also decreases the severity of the problem. Yeah, so that's what I was. Not only the stone passage, it's also severity of the pain, like the point of back emergency. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. The, in these uh, uh, comparison to placebo, they have decreased requirements for uh, uh, analgesics and uh, decreases their symptoms of colic. What about the pregnancy? Is there, is there any safety issue with the medical action steroid? Hmm. Uh, I'm not too sure about that. I'm not too sure about that. I've also noted too that uh, alpha blockers can also decrease skin symptoms as well. And there's been a lot of that in the literature. So if you have patients who are really irritated by their irritatory stent, adding an alpha blocker may help their symptoms. Hmm. So just to repeat that for uh, others. Uh, uh, Dr. Chu just said that um, use of alpha blockers may help with relieving stent, stent pain. Okay. Okay. So talking about medical stone management, uh, it can be sometimes very frustrating, especially for, for, for residents, because it's, it's often a confusing topic and there's a lot of different um, categories involved with uh, medical stone disease. And if you break it down, there's, there's 12 separate categories of physiological derangements um, with metabolic stone disease. And I know this is a, a busy slide, but I wanted to go through um, the major uh, drugs used in uh, metabolic stone disease um, and basically take a look at their indications and see when you would use them. So starting off with thiazides, it's essentially the the first line treatment for patients with hypercalcuria. And it exerts its effect by decreasing the amount of uh, urinary calcium as well as decreasing uh, calcium oxalate saturation. As, as I mentioned, it's, the, it's indicated in patients that are hypercalceric, 
For patients with absorptive hypercalcemia, it's not necessarily a selective treatment. It doesn't correct the uh, underlying basic defect, which is uh, increased absorption of calcium through the gut. And what happens is you continually uh, uh, get increased calcium through the gut and your, your body accumulates it within the bones. And eventually you get a uh, saturation point uh, where you start leaking, uh, getting an overflow of calcium and it starts leaking into the kidneys. And so with uh, long-term treatment, you eventually lose your hypocalceric action of these thiazides. Uh, if, it's, if patients are refractory to thiazides, uh, the use of uh, sodium cellulose phosphate uh, may be indicated. Uh, however, there's a lot of GI intolerance effects from that drug. For renal hypercalceria, thiazides are first-line uh, treatment because it uh, increases calcium resorption of the distal columnar tubule. The long term, you get uh, volume depletion, decreased ECF, and uh, increased resorption of sodium and calcium in the proximal convoluted tubule. There's some strong evidence for efficacy in a, a meta analysis. Uh, six of the eight uh, RCTs showed decrease in stone recurrence, and the uh, two RCTs that did not show a difference uh, had a uh, uh, shorter length of duration of study for, for two, less than two years. Uh, there's a multitude of side effects that uh, can occur with thiazides, but um, you should be aware of hypokalemia. And as a result of that, you can get intracellular acidosis and thiazide-induced hyposituria. And in these patients, you can consider uh, the use of potassium citrate to correct both the hypokalemia and the hyposituria, or add a potassium sparing diuretic. As well, thiazides can unmask uh, primary hyperparathyroidism. When you take a look at medical... You can get, you can get uh, stones from amylaride, or sorry, uh, from triamterene. Um, so it's often suggested not to uh, put them on triamterene. Uh, for, for stone disease that uh, is not hypercalceric, uh, potassium citrate is uh, one of the main players in medical management. And we'll go through these. The main effect of uh, potassium citrate is increasing uh, the citrate in the urine as well as uh, decreasing the calcium oxalate saturation. It's mainly indicated when you want to A, alkalinize the urine, so patients with uric acid stones or cysteine stones, or B, correct hypocitraturia. So it's the first line management for patients with distal RTA, thiazide induced hypocitraturia, or idiopathic hypocitraturia. As well, you often find that patients have a mixed abnormality, and so they'll have hypocitraturia in combination with enteric hyperoxaluria or in combination with uh, hyperuricosteric uh, uh, calcium oxalate stones. Moving on to allopurinol, it seems that everybody on the CTU wards is on allopurinol and has gout, and um, as, as a urology resident, you know, I wanted to figure out, you know, when do you really use allopurinol in the management of medical stone disease? And for um, hyperuricosteric patients, uh, they are patients that are at risk of uh, calcium oxalate stones because of heterogeneous nucleation of uh, the uric acid crystals. And uh, really the first line management for that is thought to be allopurinol because that decreases the amount of uric acid that's in your urine. Uh, there's another camp that uh, thinks that uh, changing the urinary milieu and giving potassium citrate may help, not necessarily because of uh, alkalinization of the urine, but more so because of uh, adding citrate to the urine. The second instance of using uh, allopurinol is in patients with gouty diathesis. These patients are at risk for both calcium oxalate and uric acid stones. Uh, more often than or not, they get uric acid stones because of um, a low pH and therefore the management of these patients is to alkalinize their urine with potassium citrate. The main effect of allopurinol is to decrease the urine uric acid, and this, it, it achieves this by being a xanthine oxidase inhibitor, so it, it uh, inhibits the conversion of uh, xanthine to uric acid. As mentioned above, the indications are essentially for hyperuricosteria and calcium oxalate stones. It's shown in a small randomized clinical trial uh, that um, it decreases the uh, uh, risk of recurrence in these patients. As well, it may be indicated in patients with, that are unable to restrict their dietary purine. 
as well, patients with gout, you know, have uric acid stones. The first line management is uh, alkalinization of the urine with potassium citrate. However, if they have a extremely elevated uh, uric acid in their in their blood or markedly elevated uric acid in their urine, uh, they may be candidates for allopurinol as well, potentially giving it uh, prior to chemotherapy to prevent uh, uric acid load on the kidneys uh, may be indicated for allopurinol. Uh, it's generally well tolerated, uh, with exception of a rash or potential allergic reactions. Uh, just special notes to be aware of xanthine stones, especially in patients with leash and eye hand syndrome. And this is a bit confusing, but I just wanted to clarify. So leash and eye hand syndrome is a deficiency in hypoxanthine phosphoribosyl transferase enzyme. And that's the um, enzyme that degrades hypoxanthine. So it blocks that pathway. And as a result, you get an increased elevated uh, uric acid in the urine. When you uh, use uh, allopurinol block xanthine oxidase, so what happens is you get a buildup of xanthine within the body and in the urine. Sorry, as well, allopurinol can precipitate gouty attacks upon initiation of the medication. And last but not least is the management of cysteine urea. These patients are difficult to manage uh, management includes uh, aggressive fluid hydration uh, as well as alkalinization of the urine and uh, possibly adding a cysteine binding agent. Theola is uh, used. It can be started at a lower dose and titrated upwards up to 1,200 milligrams uh, daily. Um, it's, often, it's, it's more often used because it's better tolerated than D-penicillamine. Uh, however, side effects are still common but less severe so than uh, D-penicillamine. There are some initial reports that captopril may be effective uh, in binding a cysteine. However, there's no long-term efficacy data. And the uh, bottom line is these patients with cysteine urea is that uh, medical compliance is poor and it's, uh, it's a, lifelong, um, a lifelong issue in terms of uh, trying to prevent these stones from, from forming. And this is just a, a brief summary table of, uh, of the drugs and various effects. Moving on to uh, sexual f function. Oh, sorry. Mike, could you comment on the use of Diamox, Sozoma, for urinary Uh I didn't really take a, a, a really good look at, at those it's drugs. Being used for urinary cell farmers, but I don't know data on that. Yeah, I didn't take a look at that specific uh, drug for alkalinizing urine. Next yeah, next year. Future Grand Rounds talks. Okay. <clears throat> so PD-5 inhibitors have really revolutionized management of, of ED. Um, it's the first line therapy for, for ED unless contraindicated. And when you're comparing the three different uh, PD-5 inhibitors, uh, there's there's no uh, evidence that supports that one is better than the other in terms of efficacy. It's really uh, patient preference driven. Uh, a study taking a look at patient preference in an open label uh, crossover study found that uh, Cialis or Tadalafils uh, may be more preferred. However, it, it doesn't control into fact uh, the, the novelty of these new, newer agents. Taking a look at the different PD-5 inhibitors, uh, so Denophil and Verdenophil have uh, uh, Mostly are mostly similar. Um, as we know, Tadalafil has a longer onset of action, has a, uh, a later um, onset of uh, maximum concentration and longer half-life. Uh, does not have any effect. Fatty food does not have effect on absorption. Um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, Vardenafil and its precaution with antiarrhythmics. And all of the um, all of the PD5 inhibitors have a precaution with concomitant alpha blocker use with the exception of uh, Cialis, uh, where uh, tamsulosin at 0.4 milligrams is okay. Now, it's important to know uh, if the patients have had an adequate trial of P5 inhibition, and you want to assess for whether the patients had adequate sexual stimulation for the drug to work. You want to take a look at the onset of action. So if it's not working with, you know, half an hour before sexual intercourse, uh, try taking the uh, medication an hour beforehand for, Cy for uh, Viagra or Levitra for Cialis uh, for two hours um, beforehand. 
Also, you, you can titrate the dose. You'll want to take a look at it if there's any food or drug interactions that may affect the dosing. Uh, as well, you want to take a look at how many times they've tried it. Uh, there's a study showing that there's a cumulative uh, increase in success uh, up to nine or ten times, the first nine or ten times of uh, attempting uh, Viagra. As well, uh, you want to see if the patients may be hypogonadal. There may be uh, a role in uh, giving a combination of testosterone and uh, PD-5 inhibitor in patients who uh, fail uh, initial uh, trial of PD-5 inhibitors. This is a small randomized controlled trial of 75 patients um, and showed that there is an improved erectile function uh, domain score at four weeks time with the use of combination therapy. And so for the most part, uh, PD-5 inhibitors are pretty well tolerated. Um, and as we know, uh, the effects of P5 inhibition on uh, vascular beds and uh, GI beds can cause headache, dyspepsia, and facial flushing in all of the P5 inhibitors. Uh, Tadalafil has a uh, increased risk of uh, backache and myalgia, and the mechanism of this is unknown at this time. Um, Sildenafil also has cross reactivity with PD6 uh, inhibition, and this uh, res which is found in the retina, and this can lead to uh, uh, visual disturbances. The incidence of side effects is greatest in the first two weeks. And most of the side effects are mild and they generally abate with time. Of note, uh, there are initial concerns with uh, reports of uh, MIs or deaths while on the drug, but when you compare them to uh, age match controls, uh, there's no increase in MI or mortality. Everyone knows that absolute contraindication is the use of organic nitrates. Um, on the AUA uh, guidelines in 2005, uh, they suggested that nitrates may be okay if uh, sorry, uh, PD5 inhibitors may be okay if nitrates were used more than two weeks ago. Uh, as well, you want to try to avoid nitrates for at least 24 hours or 48 hours, depending on which PD5 inhibitor you use. Relative contraindications include uh, a tendency for preapism, such as sickle cell uh, patients, patients with retinitis uh, pigmentosa that may have a uh, hereditary deficiency in PD uh, inhibitors, and antiarrhythmics for patients that take Vardenafil. Uh, so these are antiarrhythmics such as uh, quinidine, uh, sotolol, prokinamide, and um, uh, amiodarone. And these may all prolong the QT interval. As well, patients that are at intermediate or high cardiovascular risk uh, uh, may need further workup. And so there was a lot of concern uh, a couple of years ago with regards to uh, P5 inhibitors and whether or not these patients should actually be engaging in, in sexual intercourse. They, they may be at increased risk of having a, a fatal MI. And if you take a look at it, uh, sexual activity is actually a relatively low, uh, uh, requires low amounts of energy. It's equivalent to walking three miles per hour at, on a level, uh, level ground. <laughs> so, <laughs> in uh, epi epidemiological studies, um, the rate of non-fatal MI after sex was elevated in both healthy and patients with the previous MI. However, the baseline risk of an MI is exceedingly low without any previous histories, one in a million per hour. And if you've had a previous MI, it's 20 per million per hour. And so really, if you take, even, if you take a look at even there's the, uh, the risk, uh, elevated risk, the absolute risk is quite low. It's less than 1% and it's somewhere in the ballpark of 0 0.01 to 0.1%. And so what to do with these patients that you see in your office and they may have cardiovascular risk factors, uh, you know, how do you assess them? Well, these Princeton guidelines were uh, put forth to help in counseling these patients and, and put forth recommendations for uh, whether it is safe to uh, have sexual activity uh, and whether to treat their ED as well. So patients that are at low risk, they got the gr go, uh, green light to go. If they're at an intermediate risk, they need further cardiological workup and uh, to stratify them whether they're low risk or high risk. And patients that are in high risk, so if they have unstable angina, uh, uncontrolled hypertension, uh, severe uh, CHF, and whatnot, uh, you need to stop these patients and get them uh, optim uh, opti You have to optimize their cardiac function 
before you can uh, think about treating their ED. And so the recommendations are uh, to, to proceed with caution and uh, possibly advise against uh, not proceeding with a treatment of their ED uh, if they've had a recent MI, if they have unstable angina, uh, CHF greater than class 2, uh, uncontrolled arrhythmias, hypertension or hypotension, or if they've had a recent CVA. So PDM5 inhibitors uh, are metabolized by uh, P450, and uh, you just have to be cognizant of uh, dose alterations if they're on concomitant uh, drugs. As well, uh, the caution with uh, alpha blockers is uh, with regards to vasodilation and, and uh, risk of hypotension. Uh, it's recommended that they be stable on their alpha blocker prior to starting PD-5 inhibitors, and that you start the PD-5 inhibitors at the lowest dose. Any comments about use of PD-5 inhibitors or no comments? Mike, yeah. you recommend that the guy get Well, uh, with Tadelfil and Vardenafil, um, it's very low r reports of that uh, side effect, so you can switch, or it may abate with time. Um, generally, uh, you know, one to two weeks, and afterwards, it, it may it may abate. So you can either switch, uh, decrease dose, or uh, or, or wait it out. There was uh, there was reports of um, non arteritic. Uh, ischemic uh, optic neuropathy <laughs> um, and uh, the rates of that are elevated in sildenafil however it's most likely because sildenafil has been in uh, has been in uh, uh, been used for a longer period of time and tested for a longer period of time so comparing the PD-5 inhibitors for that risk is, is difficult at this time the, 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 the rates of those that are being reported is very low out of 3 million uh, uh, prescribed uh, there's only been 34 reports of sildenafil causing that, or in association with that. Right. Yeah. I know it's been it's been uh, uh, a subject of uh, more study recently. Um, I didn't specifically take a look at at those. Those trials, though, there may be there may be preliminary evidence that it may be beneficial. Just uh, for the record, the what's that called again? Non-ischemic. Non-arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy. Yeah, the consensus of the exam committee was from the experts like Jerry Brock, etc. Uh, that it's not really the use of the biomarkers. Hmm. No, there are some reports where they took them off of the, the PD-5 inhibitors and then they improved and then they re-challenged them and they, they may have had a re-flare of that, so. Right, the uh, alpha blockers and PD-5 are so commonly used and, and there's clear interactions of patients between them. Any comments on which ones, like which combinations like you think of as far as which alpha blocker and which PD-5 inhibitors? So, um, uh, Tadalafil has come out uh, saying that it, it's, it's uh, used with precaution, but it's likely safe to combine uh, the selective alpha blocker, so tamsulosin or Fulmax at 0.4 milligrams in combination with Cialis. But uh, I'm not aware of the, the other PD-5 inhibitors uh, putting that recommendation out. So moving on to uh, premature ejaculation. Um, Psychosexual counseling uh, was initially thought to be uh, helpful in this regard. However, uh, long-term data hasn't really uh, borne this out. Therefore, there's, this, there's been a switch towards uh, medical management of this. And the two main options are SSRIs as well as topical uh, anesthetic ointments. Daily use of SSRIs can reduce the effect in five to 10 days. When you compare the SSRIs, it appears as though paroxetine or Paxil may have the uh, greatest effect. You have minor side effects, they often subside within two to three weeks, and they can include fatigue, nausea, loose stools. There's very infrequently reported decreased libido or decreased penile rigidity. <coughs> Contraindication to SSRIs is uh, MAO inhibitors. You can get a uh, serotonin syndrome. 
as well. Uh, just proceed with caution when you discontinue the drugs. You may have a withdrawal syndrome. Uh, be aware of various drug interactions with P450 drugs. As well, Health Canada put out a uh, warning in 2004 that there may be increased risk of uh, suicidal ideation in attempts, especially in patients that are uh, adolescents. Um, there's a recent meta-analysis that, may, that uh, shows that this, this effect may actually extend to the young adult age to less than 25 years of age. So proceed with caution. These, these studies were taking a look at patients that were depressed and they, they might, may very well have had suicidal ideation beforehand, so it's difficult to control out that uh, variable. The use of on-demand SSRIs is also being used and uh, it appears to be efficacious, well tolerated, uh, however, there appears to be less ejaculatory delay than the use of SSRIs on a daily basis. Coming down the pipeline is uh, Depoxetine. It's a rapid-acting, short half-life uh, SSRI, and it's been shown to increase the intravaginal ejaculatory latency time. Uh, the other option is use of anesthetic to topical ointments. You can get penile, penile hypoanesthesia as well as uh, transvaginal absorption. Last but not least is uh, androgen deficiency in the aging male. And it's a, it's a topic that's uh, received a lot of press and, and it could be a grand rounds topic on its own. Just wanted to talk about a, a few basic concepts of uh, testosterone options and uh, uh, monitoring of therapy. There are several changes uh, that occur with aging and it's thought that testosterone uh, may help improve uh, a lot of these uh, different facets. We know that testosterone can uh, help with body composition and strength, uh, increase bone mineral density. Um, the effect on LDL and total cholesterol may, may slightly decrease it. Um, most of the studies show that there's no change in the good cholesterol or HDL cholesterol, and there's been no change in the rate of MI or CVAs thus far. But the ultimate impact on cardiovascular disease is unknown at this time. It's thought to improve libido and uh, help maintain uh, erectile physiology. There are, there's three main uh, forms of administration, injectable, oral, and transdermal. Let's take a look at injectable preparations. Um, they were often uh, wrought with uh, uh, roller coaster phenomenon where you get super physiological levels and then a, a decrease in their levels. And because of this, there may be an increased risk of polycythemia from this. There's a more recent uh, formulation, uh, TN decanate, uh, that uh, you can achieve actual stable levels without this roller coaster phenomenon. However, it's, as far as I'm aware, it's not available in the US or Canada at this time. For the oral med uh, preparations, um, the main issue here is uh, first pass metabolism by the liver. And so to combat this, they, alkyla they alkylated the testosterone. However, because of this, uh, with methyl testosterone, you can get liver toxicity and it's basically fall falling out of favor because of this. You can also use uh, buckle tabs and you can adhere to the gum uh, by the incisor teeth. However, application of this uh, has, has been inconvenient. Uh, there's a new newer formulation, T and decanate, uh, that uh, is preferentially taken up by the chylomicrons of the, the GI tract, so it bypasses the first pass metabolism. However, uh, there's erratic bioavailability and it's not available in the, the US at this time. Most popular route is probably transdermal. Uh, initially, it was with the testosterone patch. However, um, because of the enhancer that was used with the patch, uh, skin reactions were quite common in up to 67% of patients, as well as visible. And, uh, and, and therefore, more, more people moved on to the testosterone gel. Um, this, it appears to be uh, well tolerated. And you, and you place the gel on the abdomen, shoulders, or the upper arms. The gel dries within five minutes. Uh, you can shower 30 minutes later without having a decrease in uh, testosterone level. And the likelihood of actual skin-to-skin -skin transfer is actually quite low. Uh, there are minimal local reactions and uh, you can achieve a steady state of testosterone in two to three days. Uh, the advantage of using this is that you can return to your uh, baseline testosterone within 72 to 96 hours within stopping it as opposed to a um, uh, an IM drug that may last for several weeks. So if you need to stop the testosterone for, for any reason, it goes on quite quickly. Adverse effects uh, can include polycythemia, more so in the injectables than uh, other formulations. 
uh, for prostate, um, there's a lot of um, a lot of recent literature on this, uh, but it appears as though in the short term, at least within three years, there's little effect on BPH or prostate cancer. But with these diseases that have long natural histories, uh, the long-term effect is unknown at this time. Uh, as well, there have been reports of sleep apnea. Liver toxicity is actually quite rare now, um, except for those alkylated teas that aren't really used. Uh, gynecomastia is rare, as well as food retention. Uh, so the Sexual Medicine Society of North America in 2004 uh, put forth some recommendations with regards to um, uh, therapy and management. Um, and uh, they, they think that uh, all the currently available uh, testosterone preparations are safe and effective, with the exception of the alkylated testosterones. Uh, as well, you want to avoid superphysiological testosterone levels, and there's a question of whether uh, maintaining circadian rhythms is uh, beneficial or not. There's, as uh, talked about before, there's preliminary observations that the combination of uh, testosterone and P5 inhibitors uh, may be beneficial in patients with ED. Uh, the contraindications to use include severe bladder outlet obstruction secondary to BPH, uh, even though uh, there's no evidence that it uh, causes progression of uh, BPH. As well, breast cancer and prostate cancer are absolute uh, contraindications at this time. Uh, there's those that suggest that patients that are successfully treated uh, after a prudent interval with no residual cancer may be candidates. Uh, it's, the wording is left quite vague for, for that particular reason. It's sort of up to the discretion between the, uh, the physician and the patient as to, uh, after the discussion of the risk and benefits, whether to proceed with uh, management of uh, hypogonadism. In terms of monitoring, uh, they put forth recommendations to monitor uh, the fasting lipids, uh, get a periodic CBC to assess for polycythemia. Uh, for prostate monitoring, uh, they recommend that patients greater than 40 should get a DRE and PDSA at baseline and be followed closely within the first year and then yearly thereafter. Uh, they, do not, they do not recommend a routine truss biopsy, but only if it's clinically indicated with uh, abnormal DRE or PSA. Uh, they also recommend a liver function test prior to treatment and also to monitor for any uh, negative uh, uh, behavioral changes such as aggressiveness or hypersexuality uh, as well uh, keep a close eye on whether or not there's a change in sleep apnea. This is a, a, a monitoring schedule put forth uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine. And it's essentially the same monitoring for those adverse effects. Uh, the only uh, minor or major differences are uh, basically making uh, lipid or uh, liver function tests optional as uh, it may not testosterone may not have a significant effect on those parameters. The big controversy is how do we monitor the prostate. There's several different approaches as to uh, various PSA thresholds or uh, differences in um, the rate of PSA change uh, and when to refer to urologists or when to perform a biopsy. It's, um, the general take I got from, from all of this was uh, uh, do a biopsy if you think it's clinically indicated. You may have a, a bit of a lower threshold to perform a biopsy in these patients. Um, that being said, uh, you don't necessarily need to do routine biopsies to, 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 check, to check on these patients, only if it's clinically indicated. That's the end of my talk. I had more to go, but I'll stop there.